an anthology of readings of Almighty God's words. Interpretations of the Mysteries of God's Words to the Entire Universe Chapter 26 From all of the words spoken by God, it can be seen that the day of God draws nearer with each passing day. It is as if this day is right before people's eyes, as if it will arrive tomorrow. Thus, after reading God's words, all people are struck with terror, and they also sense a part of the world's desolation, like leaves that fall in a breeze accompanied by a light rain. People disappear without a trace, as if they have all vanished entirely. Everyone has an ominous feeling, and though all people try hard and wish to satisfy God's will, and each person uses all their might to satisfy God's intention, that God's will may proceed smoothly and without obstruction, such a sentiment is always mingled with a sense of foreboding. Take today's utterances. If they were broadcast to the masses, announced to the whole universe, then all people would bow down and weep. For in the words, I will watch over the whole earth, and appearing in the east of the world with righteousness, majesty, wrath, and chastisement, I shall reveal myself to the myriad hosts of humanity. All who understand spiritual matters see that no one can escape God's chastisement, and that after experiencing the suffering of chastisement, all will be separated according to their kind. Truly, this is a step of God's work, and no one can change it. When God created the world, when he led mankind, he showed his wisdom and wondrousness. And only when he brings this era to an end will people behold his true righteousness, majesty, wrath, and chastisement. Furthermore, it is only through chastisement that they are able to see his righteousness, majesty, and wrath. This is a path that must be taken, just as during the last days, God's incarnation is necessary and indispensable. After proclaiming the end of all mankind, God shows to man the work he does today. For example, God says, the Israel of old has ceased to be, and today's Israel has risen up, erect, and towering in the world, and has stood up in the hearts of all humanity. Today's Israel shall surely attain the source of existence through my people. Ah, hateful Egypt! How can you not exist within my chastisement? God deliberately shows people the consequences that two antithetical countries meet in his hands, in one sense referring to Israel, which is material, and in another referring to all God's chosen ones, which is to say, to how God's chosen ones change as Israel changes. When Israel has wholly returned to its original form, all of the chosen ones will subsequently be made complete. Which is to say, Israel is a meaningful symbol of those whom God loves. Egypt, meanwhile, is the representative convergence of those whom God hates. The more decayed it becomes, the more corrupt those who are hated by God become and Babylon subsequently falls. This forms a clear contrast. By proclaiming the ends of Israel and Egypt, 
God reveals the destination of all people. Thus, when mentioning Israel, God speaks also of Egypt. From this, it can be seen that the day of Egypt's destruction is the day of the world's annihilation, the day when God chastises all people. This will happen soon. God is about to complete it, something that is quite invisible to man's naked eye, yet indispensable and unalterable. God says, All those who stand against me will surely be chastised by me for eternity. For I am a jealous God and will not lightly spare men for all that they have done. Why does God speak in such absolute terms? And why has he personally become flesh in the nation of the great red dragon? From God's words, his aim can be seen. He has not come to save people or to show them compassion or to care for them or protect them. He has come to chastise all those who oppose him. For God says, none can escape my chastisement. God lives in the flesh, and furthermore, he is a normal person, yet he does not forgive people for their weakness in being unable to know him subjectively. Instead, he condemns men for their sins by means of a normal person. He makes all those who behold his flesh those who are chastised, and they thus become sacrifices for all who are not the people of the nation of the great red dragon. But this is not one of the primary goals of God's incarnation. God became flesh chiefly in order to do battle in the flesh with the great red dragon and to bring shame upon it through battle. Because God's great power is more evidenced by battling the great red dragon in the flesh than in the spirit, God fights in the flesh to show his deeds and omnipotence. Innumerable people have been innocently condemned by God's incarnation, and countless people have thereby been thrown into hell and cast into chastisement and suffer in the flesh. This is the demonstration of God's righteous disposition. And regardless of how those who oppose God change today, God's upright disposition will never change. Once condemned, people are condemned forever, never able to rise again. Man's disposition cannot be like God's. Toward those who oppose God, people are by turns hot and cold. They waver left and right, now up, now down. They are incapable of remaining constant, sometimes hating those who oppose God to their bones, sometimes holding them close. Today's circumstances have come about because people do not know God's work. Why does God say such words as, The angels are, after all, angels. God, after all, is God. The demons are, after all, demons. The unrighteous are still unrighteous. And the holy are still holy. Can you not comprehend it? Could God have misremembered? Thus God says, Each person is separated according to their kind and finds their way unawares back into the bosom of their families. From this it can be seen that today God has already classified all things into their families so that it is no longer an infinite world and people no longer eat from the same big pot. 
but perform their own duty in their own home, playing their own role. This was God's original plan when creating the world. After being separated according to kind, people would each eat their own meal, meaning that God would commence judgment. As a result, from God's mouth came these words, I will restore the former state of creation. I will restore everything to the way it originally was, profoundly changing everything so that everything will return to the bosom of my plan. This is precisely the aim of all God's work, and it is not hard to understand. God will complete his work. Could man stand in the way of his work? And could God rip up the covenant established between him and man? Who could alter what is done by the Spirit of God. Could any man at all do so? In the past, people grasped a law in God's words. When God's words are spoken, they are soon made real. There is no falsehood in this. Since God has said he shall chastise all peoples, and furthermore, since he has issued his administrative decrees, it can be seen that God's work has been carried out to a certain stage. The constitution that was issued forth to all people addressed their lives and their attitude toward God. It did not get to the root. It did not say that it was based on God's predestination but on man's behavior at that time. The administrative decrees of today are extraordinary and they speak of how all people will be separated according to their own kind and will receive chastisements commensurate with their actions. Without a close reading, no problem can be found in this. Because it is only during the final age that God separates all things according to their kind. After reading this, most people remain puzzled and confused. They still adopt a lukewarm attitude, not seeing the urgency of the times, and so they do not take this as a warning. Why, at this point, are God's administrative decrees, which are announced to the whole universe, shown to man? Do these people represent all those throughout the universe? Could God, afterward, have more mercy on these people? Have these people grown two heads? When God chastises the people of the entire universe, when all manner of catastrophes strike, changes will occur in the sun and moon as a result of these catastrophes. And when these catastrophes end, the sun and moon will have been altered, and this is called the transition. Suffice to say, the disasters of the future will be grievous. Night might take the place of day, the sun might not appear for a year. There might be several months of searing heat. A waning moon might always face mankind. There might appear the bizarre state of the sun and moon rising together, and so on. Following several cyclical changes, ultimately, with the passage of time, they shall be renewed. God pays special attention to his plans for those who belong to the devil. Thus, he deliberately says, of the human beings within the universe, all those belonging to the devil will be exterminated. Before these people have shown their true colors, God always uses them to render service. As a result, he pays no heed to their doings. 
He gives them no reward when they do well, nor does he dock their wages when they perform badly. As such, he disregards them and gives them the cold shoulder. He does not suddenly change because of their goodness. For regardless of the time or place, man's essence does not change. Just like the covenant established between God and man, and just like, as man says, there will be no change even if the seas run dry and the rocks crumble. Thus, God simply sorts those people according to their kind and does not readily heed them. From the time of creation until today, the devil has never comported itself well. It has always caused interruptions, disturbances, and dissent. When God acts or speaks, the devil always tries to participate, but God takes no notice of it. At the mention of the devil, God's rage flows forth, insuppressible, because they are not of one spirit. There is therefore no connection only distance and separation. Following the revelation of the seven seals, the state of the earth grows always worse, and all things advance shoulder to shoulder with the seven seals, not falling behind in the slightest. Throughout God's words, people are seen by God as stupefied yet they do not awaken at all. To reach a higher point, to bring forth the strength of all people, and moreover, to conclude God's work at its peak, God asks people a string of questions, as if inflating their bellies, and thus He replenishes all people. Because these people have no real stature, Based on the actual circumstances, those who are inflated are goods that are up to standard, while those who are not are useless trash. This is God's requirement of man and the aim of the method by which he speaks. In particular, when God says, Could it be that I, when on earth, am not the same as I am in heaven? Could it be that I, when in heaven, cannot come down to the earth? Could it be that I, when on earth, am unworthy to be born up to heaven? These questions serve as a clearer path on which man might know God. From God's words, God's urgent will is beheld. People are incapable of attaining it and God repeatedly adds conditions, thus reminding all people to know the heavenly God on earth and to know the God who is in heaven but lives on earth. From God's words can be seen the states of man. All mankind spends effort on my words, undertaking investigations of their own into my outward semblance, but they all meet with failure, their efforts bearing no fruit, and instead are struck down by my words and dare not get up again. Who can understand God's sorrow? Who can comfort God's heart? Who accords with God's heart in what he asks? When people bear no fruit, they deny themselves and truly submit to God's orchestrations. Gradually, as they show their true heart, each is separated according to their kind, and it is thus seen that the essence of the angels is pure obedience to God. And so God says, humanity is exposed in its original form, when God's work reaches this step, it will all have been completed, 
God appears to say nothing of his being an exemplar for his sons and people. Instead, focusing on making all people display their original form. Do you understand the true meaning of these words?